Good morning, Mark Lewis Francis. Hey, hey, doing you good? I'm good, thank you. I'm really well. I'm really, really good. Well. Good, good to be speaking with you, man. It's um, it's Commonwealth Games year, and it's in Birmingham. And I just think it would have been, you know, remiss of us not to do uh, an interview with you, have a have a conversation about um the Commonwealth Games, what it means to you, what you know it means to Birmingham, it being hosted in in that city, you know, and uh, your affiliation with the competition over the years, which started with a bang. Um, albeit not the type of bang you probably would have uh, you would have liked, right? Um, what's it what's it mean to you? Obviously, post track years post track. Now you're a working man. You've got multiple businesses. You're not as immersed in the sport as you once were. But I saw that you recently went down to Birmingham with the kids for an athletics meet and got to see the new stadium. Of it was it a Diamond League, I think, or, or maybe prior to that. Diamond League for me personally. Uh, it was a day out, just like any family man. You know, um, you know, I'm still privileged enough to still get tickets from North Respect or pay sport management, you know, and be able to go down there and show my kids a level of athletics from it just being on TV. Do you know what I mean? And to, to actually interact with the athletes, you know, which is amazing. And uh, I feel really privileged to actually be able to do that and show my kids and my, and my friends' kids that kind of experience. So um, to go down to Birmingham and to see the new stadium, absolutely amazing. Not just for the Commonwealth Games, for for Birmingham itself. You know, uh, you know how passionate I am about my town. I love my town. You know, uh, my town gave me so much within the sport. You know, um, so to be able to go down there and you know mingle with the likes of Linford, you know Dina, you know, um, and my daughter who's only seven, to actually be around these high quality athletes is amazing. You know, um, I always say we, I've always got a little bit of a head start than anybody else when it comes to educating my kids about my sport. Do you know what I mean? And it was nice actually going to the stadium and make my daughter see what I used to do. Like, you know, amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah, it must be one thing for her to see pictures on your wall, plaques, medals, cups or whatever. Um, but to see daddy in the environment and, you know, yeah. see the love that you get from from others, um, that must be uh, that must be special, really. Oh, most definitely because at home I'm just daddy to her, and you know, um, she don't really know too much about my athletic career like that because I don't really shove it in her face like that. You know, a lot of people say is she's she gonna do athletics, she do whatever she wants to do. I support her in any form of way. You know, if she does do athletics, amazing. If she doesn't, then you know, um, it's just what it is. The Commonwealth Games itself, um, obviously, when it was announced all those years ago, it was in slightly controversial circumstances given it was meant to be in Durban. Um, and the decision was was changed due to all sorts of circumstances. But when you heard the news and having seen what's developed in Perry Bar and in the local area since then, um, obviously been to the stadium now, talk about that perspective. We'll get into the track and what, you know, the Commonwealth Games mean to you, but just talk about what you know that will do for the local area and what it means to the, the people that live in and amongst Birmingham. I always use Manchester as an example, it? you know, because where the Manchester City football ground was, that's where the Commonwealth Games was. And if you look at the surrounding areas of Manchester before the Commonwealth Games, it was rough, you know, and now it's a, it's a thriving area. And I'm just hoping that Birmingham and Birmingham City Council do the same for Birmingham, you know, because there's a lot of mad talent in my city that's just not being nurtured, you know, um, and with the new facilities sites, not just the athletes up and coming, but the locals. Remember, I drove past Alexander Stadium on a win. I got suspended from school. I was with my dad. I wasn't allowed to sit down in the house. He was driving down the Warsaw Road and he says, I, I looked at the stadium and said, dad, come, let's go take a look. And when we drove in there, we realised it was an athletic stadium. And that's where my athletic career started. So instead of going home and getting beaten, I joined an athletic club. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, you know, you know how the Caribbean families are. You know, you're not sitting, if you're going to misbehave in school, you're not sitting in the house, you're going to be active. And being active made me focused at school. And that's my story, and that's only a little bit of the story. So for me, I was hoping with the new swimming baths, the new track and field stadium, the new hockey pitches, they're accessible for the public and not just for the elite athletes, if that makes any sense. So yeah, it means a lot, man. But let's just see what the, the legacy is before we start hyping up anything. What are your fondest memories, right? Because it all kicks off for you in 2002 on home soil in Manchester, as you mentioned. The hype behind the scenes was mad. 
Dwayne Chambers, yourself, you know, direct, there was a there was a host of names in there. Um, you know, Christian, you know, the trials were hot. Yeah. It was uh it was it was a, it was an important year for you in your development. It was still quite early. It was two years before you go on to obviously have that crazy night in Athens in the Olympics. But talk about everything to do with 2002, the build up, yeah. what it meant to you, how you hyped yourself up, and obviously the final, how it all how it all ended. Well, 2002, I got invited to go up and do a press release for the Commonwealth Games um, and go up and have a look at the stadium just before it was built. I mean, just before it was finished. And um, I just remember where the 100 meters start line was they never had to stand there and I remember going into the stadium and, and just looking down the whole street I don't think the track was in at that point either and just thinking wow I'm nervous and that's when I, I realised that how much I wanted it because it was nerve wracking I, I don't think I ever competed in front of a home crowd and um, yeah so I did the press conference and then I came home then I sat down with my coach and we just got focused it just felt like something switched and I'm a firm believer of seeing is believing so actually going to the track and looking at the environment that I'm going to be competing in, I think it was raining as well, it was all. And then, um, yeah, just going home and just getting my head down and um, getting ready for the trials. And then we had the trials up in Manchester. You know, I was working with uh, a physio called Paula Wilde, um, amazing physio. And um, she was just talking about mental preparation, you know, um, talking about, you know, sitting down and, thinking about the race and before I've even raced and all the rest of it. So there was a lot of mental preparation before the trials even began. And uh, I just remember going to the trials and getting physio and running my first heat and then running something crazy. I think I ran a, a, a crazy fast time in my first heat. And then, um, and this is and this is going through into the finals of the trials. And I just remember my, my coach saying to me, just qualify. You don't need to do too much. Just qualify. Um, so I qualified for the Commonwealth Games. And normally when you qualify, you can kind of relax a little bit. But then, you know, as an athlete, you, you look at um, results and bits and pieces. And at that time, Dwayne Chambers was flying. Kim Collins was flying. Um, Mark Burns, Saka Powell was coming onto the scene. So it wasn't, it wasn't going to be an easy race. And because it was on home soil, the pressure just felt immense. You know, it felt it felt like I had to go out there and I had to achieve. Remember, I'm this young up, up and coming kid. You know, um, and a lot of the people that I competed with at my World Juniors, I was going to compete with at the Commonwealth Games. So I know there was a lot of them that wanted revenge. You know, Michael Freita, Mark Burns, Dale Brown. It was mad talent, mad mad talent. So um, yeah, so leading up into the games. Um, I felt good. I felt really good. You know, I felt I felt like every step I was taking, I was absolutely floating. You know, um, at that time, the, the press was really hyping me up. But then we just stopped watching TV and reading papers. You know, um, we was very lucky back then because we didn't have social media like I really have it now. So, you know, you could disappear and hide from certain things, you know. Um, but yeah. But like I said, you know, going into Manchester was my first ever, you know. So I went into Manchester made it into the final. I remember going down into the blocks, nervous. I just couldn't keep still. I was nervous, really nervous. The gun went off. I remember getting out of the blocks and having an amazing start. But I think Kim Collins was just in front of me. And I went to go pick up and push through. I felt something run up the back of my leg. And then all of a sudden I was on the floor rolling around, tore my hamstring, devastating. I didn't even know what was going on around me. And then as I lifted my head up, I said, Dwayne, you know, I'm thinking Dwayne won the team, but, you know, he, 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 he pulled out as well, Krem. So for me, bittersweet. I thought Commonwealth Games, isn't it? You know, uh, I had to go home. I wasn't able to compete in the European Championships. It was a devastating year, you know, um, especially after having the amazing year in 2001 in Edmonton, you know, um, running sub-10, you know, and then, not making it into the final made me want to go home and work even harder. But yeah, it was it, heartbreaking, heartbreaking, heartbreaking. That's that should have been my first ever major senior championship medal, but it just didn't happen. It didn't happen. So again, you know, instead of feeling defeated, we trained again and we trained really hard, really, really hard. 
you know, 2003 season again, we came out and we were running really well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Manchester was a great experience. A great, great talk experience. About, talk, talk about the crowd because like, there are going to be some athletes who compete for England in Birmingham. It's going to be, like you said, their first exposure to a, a home crowd like that. It's 10 years on from the Olympics in this country. So there, there, there's going to be a, a lot of interest. I imagine it will be sold out. Talk about it, how you talk about handling that, you know, both in the warm up and in the prep. And is there anything that you would kind of offer as advice for a young athlete? Can you even offer any advice? I know it's an individual sport. You can, I think you 100% you can because I really vibe off the crowd, you know, there's nothing sweeter than walking out into the stadium and the crowd acknowledging you and seeing that you're out there to represent and they make an absolute noise. That there for me would make me put an extra two seconds on top of me. You understand what I'm saying? Like that day, I just pulled the performance up. And I just remember walking out and, um, into Manchester and seeing a full stage and thinking, wow, this is mad. And then just looking on the track, you know, acknowledging it and focusing on the job in hand. Because if you soak that in too much, it can, it, can, it can mash you up. But just, you know, when you're on the start line and, you know, they call out your name and you hear the roar, something in your belly just goes, man. It's like, yeah, this is it. This is what I've been working for. All the moments of throwing up on the track, feeling lactic, listening to your coach saying, one more rep, one more rep, you know, that's what all that, that's what it all works out to. Do you know what I mean? And for me, it was the icing on the cake. And to have a home crowd too, it's the best feeling. It's the best feeling because they're all there to support you. You know what I mean? So I always embrace it. I always embrace it. Even if sometimes I'm shaking and I feel nervous, by the time I hear on your marks, I'm embracing it. I'm good to go. You know, I'm there for you guys, isn't it? So let's go. So yeah. Four years late. Four years later in um, Australia, I don't remember partying with you. I remember partying with other athletes, but I don't remember partying with you. What happened there? Australia was tricky for me because you got to remember. I you had two competitions to navigate, right? That was what it was. I yeah. do remember that. Yeah, come back to me. Talk about it. Yeah, Australia was tricky, isn't it? Because. I left Birmingham to move to London and I was with a new coach. I was in a new training environment. I was doing everything new, you know. Um, and I was speaking to Marlon the other day about this same conversation. So we travelled out to Australia and we was training with a guy called Matt Sherville, Shervington. Amazing, amazing sprinter. So he was our training partner. And we, we went over to Manly and we was training with him. And I remember coming to the stadium with Marlon and Matt Shervington was absolutely annihilating us out of the blocks. And my head was spun, yeah? M me and Marlon, at the end of the session, looked at each other and we didn't speak all the way back to the apartment. There was not one word spoken. And then, and then we just sat in there. I remember I had a Nintendo DS. I didn't, even, I didn't even have a shower. I just took off my clothes and went back into my bed and played on my DS all afternoon. I was devastated. Yeah, it was like, what's going on here? Matt Sherrington's coming out the blocks and going bum, 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 and leaving us, absolutely annihilating us. But we had a we had a competition in I think it was in Melbourne. Um, I think Maury set that competition up for us. I remember going to this competition and feeling nervous, like I'm gonna run something like 10 8, 10 9, devastated. And um, I remember going into the blocks, the gun going off, racing and winning that competition running a fast opener, the fastest opener that I think I've ever opened up with in a couple of years. So sometimes you've got to realise you know, the travel takes it out of you, yeah? The new environment takes it out of you and you can't always go off your training, you know? Because training and competition are two different things. And me and Marlon were laughing because Marlon was the same. He was like, I was devastated, Mark. I can't believe it. He was whooping his ass. I mean, like whooping him in training, you know, um, when he, before he left to come to Australia. And now he's killing us. But it just goes to show that you can't really put too much focus into your training, you know? So that there, for me, calmed me down a little bit. So going into the Commonwealth Games, I was highly confident. But again, you had the Jamaicans. It was the Jamaican year in 2006 where all the sprinters came out and was dominating. So I was extra nervous again. My mindset wasn't where it used to be. And I went into the 100 metres and I full started. The end of my, the end of my champs. Went into the relay, full started again. It was the end of my champs. So the reason why you probably see me partying because I was devastated. I never, I came all this way and I didn't do the job in hand, and I got absolutely annihilated with, with the media as well. You know, um, which is 
which is right. You know, you can't be funding someone that's not going to perform. And, I, you know, I accepted that at the time. So, um, yeah, so 06 was horrible. And then obviously, you know, about 07 and 08, you know. Uh, well, I mean, those, those were the years that, that it, it was peak for you, right? It looked like it was close to being finished. And, and that's what makes the achievements we're about to talk about in 2010 all the more sweeter and, and your journey coming from London up until that point, um, you know, eight years later, uh, is, 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 a, is a, I guess, one that a lot of athletes can really study uh, and take a leaf uh, out of your book for because you dealt with both adversity, well, you know, capitulation in the final 100 metre final, four years later, it's, it doesn't get any worse. Um, yeah. And then you, you, your career is almost... A lot of people, a lot of people write you off, right? Talk about it. I was, I was, I was done. I'm not gonna lie. My heart, my mental state, my physical state, my spirit, it was shot. It was fit. Um, but again, my life before track and field was much tougher. So what I was going through now, I had to kind of take it back to the start again. You know, single parent mother. You know, it was tough when we was growing up. So what, I'm, I'm actually travelling the world doing a sport that I enjoy doing and I'm getting a bit of criticism. So I just need to soak all that in, start making my own decisions and my own choices and moving forward. So I decided to leave Tony Lester, which is, you know, I've I, I really got a lot of love for Tony Lester, a lot of love and respect for Tony Lester. But at that time, I had to leave and I left. I sat down with Linford. Uh, we had a conversation. He asked me what I wanted at, at the end of the uh, conversation. And I told him I just want to be a champion. So 2009, after my operations on my Achilles tendon, we got, it, we got to work. And like I said, I will always have love and respect for this guy because he doesn't have to do what he does. He took time out of his own life to focus on my life. You understand what I'm saying? And we got, he got me to a point in 2010 where I felt like Mark of 2001. Do you understand? Yeah, an older, mature athlete, making my own decisions, making my own sacrifices, you know, and turning up. I think that's the main thing about everything, still being able to turn up after having so much bad results, if that makes any sense. So 2009, I started training. Um, right, I joined him in 2008, but 2009 was the year that I started training. Came out that season. I think I opened up with like 10 6, the worst yeah, opener. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Came back and then just kept my head down. I was still having pains in my kidneys and all the rest of it. So, finishing 2009 season, it was terrible. But I knew where I was, you know. I knew that I had to get my mind right and put in extra work. So, I put in the extra work in 2010 winter season, just after Christmas. I mean, just before 2009, 2010. I was putting in a whole bunch of work, lifting heavy weights, sprinting, doing 400 meter reps, and something that I've never done before. And uh, believing in my coach, came out in the indoor season in 2010 and ran 1050, 1050, 1050 1056, 1054. I was like, yes, that's what I need. So I think we cut that season short, the indoor season short, and we went back into training. I know my speed's there now, I know my speed's back. Um, 6.50 equates to something like 10 to 10 one. I'm not sure how, how they work it out, but I knew it was round about there. So I knew I was in some decent kind of shape, just needed to lose some weight. Um, qualified for the European Championships as a relay runner. Went to the holding camp. Had some food, had food poisoning. I lost the weight that I needed to I lose. It's just mad how God works, isn't it? You know, <clears throat> I'm training really, really, really hard. Lloyd Cow came over to me and back straight. He said, Mark, you look good, you know. I said, what do you mean? I'm paranoid, you know. I'm, remember, my head's all over the place. I'm paranoid. He said, Mark, you look good, you know. I said, what do you mean? He said, Mark, you look so sweet running down the back straight. Again, I found a man with a cool heart gave me confidence out of nowhere. Do you understand what I'm saying? So all these people that I'm mentioning were my supporters, but from far. Do you understand what I'm saying? We'd always come and whisper a little thing in my ear and say, yeah, man. Yeah, man, you look good. So for me, that boosted me again, you know. And Linford, you know, we wasn't training mad hard. We was just repeating, 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 repeating. At the end of that now, Charles Van Commonly came over to me just after lunch and said, Mark, I want to give you the third spot. I ain't going to lie, I cried. 
you know, because he, he believed in me, he gave me that third spot, and he, he he allowed me to compete, which is something that I needed at that point, yeah, for me to move forward. So I competed in the European Championship. I remember him saying to me, just finish 10th, 10th is good. You're giving me an opportunity, you're telling me to finish 10th. That's not in my DNA. I want a medal. So cut a long story short, we had Dwayne Chambers, um, La Metra, and there was another French guy, I can't remember his name, but they was all running good that year. So I just went into that final, believing in myself, European Championships, believing in myself, stood on the start line, had a great start, pushed out the blocks, stood up tall, ran through the line, I came second. I don't know how I came second, but I came second, which was amazing. Which gave me the confidence going into Delhi. Now I'm a European silver medalist. Something that I've been waiting for for a very long time. You know what I mean? And like, that for me, at that time, people say to me, what's the biggest achievement you ever achieved? They expect me to say the Olympic gold medal, but they don't know the sacrifices that I made to achieve the European silver medal. So I'm, I'm on cloud nine. I'm, yes, I'm like, yeah, let's go. Go to Delhi now. And a lot of people would say most of the major athletes wasn't there at that time, but you only can compete with who's there, right? That's what I'm saying. So we had Laurent Clark, we had the Canadian guy. These guys have run quick all year. You know? So for me now, I'm thinking I need to go to this race and execute this race because it's 2010. I suppose we did in 2002. It's time. Yeah, try not to get no false starts. Do what you got to do. I remember going into the heats and just taking it step by step not thinking about nobody just making the final. Linford was there with me as well, so we was going through the we was going through the, um, the rounds. Just like a training block, you know, executing what we needed to execute. Then we got into the final, and he says, let, let it go now. You understand? So I said, all right, then cool. Bam. Went through the final call room, got the blocks, bam, bam, bam. Did a couple of starts and that, you know, um, just to make sure. Because remember the last one, I had a false start. I don't want to do that again. Um, <laughs> did a couple of blocks, walked out to the stadium, set myself up ready to go. The gun goes off, my block slip. I say, I'm not giving up. Yeah, I just pushed through it all the way through. I knew the wrong was out. I just said, relax, keep, keep just keep calm, bam, cross the line, silver medal. Thank you. That silver medal meant so much to me. Yeah, that silver medal I gave up so much for, so much sacrifice, so much criticism. I had to keep my mind right, and I actually did it. So the lesson in the story there is: don't listen to everybody. Do your own thing. Have self belief. You know, always believe in yourself. You've worked for this; they haven't. You understand what I'm saying? So for me, it's always a case in track and field. You just got to do your own thing. You got to do your own thing, and you will get your dream. It's, it's inevitable. You know, at that point, you're embracing the fact that 2014 is going to be my last year, your last one, right? So, how talk about your mindset, how different that was going into that one versus 2002, which was on home soil, starting on home soil, finishing on home soil. You know, how did you how did you walk into that? 2014, I moved back to Birmingham, I was about to start a brand new life, I'm going through trials and tribulations. And I thought to myself. I'm still competing. I'm still training. I still believe I've got it. Let's have one more year. So I went and trained with a guy called Tony Hadley. Still getting mentored off uh, Linford and that. Still getting bits and pieces of advice. But I had to leave. You know, um, I had to leave London. London was too much for me. So I came back to Birmingham. <coughs> and um, I started training. But I was tired. Everything I was doing, man, I was just tired, man. I had enough. You understand what I'm saying? I just, I just wasn't motivated. Kids are getting big. I need to be a dad. You know what I mean? Instead of me thinking about myself, I need to think about them. They have a life too, which which, which they need me. You know what I mean? And so I just wound it down a little bit. And then I got the offer for the bobsleigh, which was perfect because it's hard to give up athletics. It's hard to walk away from athletics. But the bobsleigh gave me a gateway to still train, but not be affiliated with athletics. You know, so I left and um, started bobsleigh. And um, I did that for three years and then I was able just to, to 
slowly submerge myself into everyday normal life, you know, and, and, and I ain't going to lie, it's, it's, uh, life's a lot easier just doing that. I don't have to um, answer to nobody. I don't have to hit targets, you know. I do miss the sport. I miss the sport badly because that was my, that was my, that was me, you know, Mark Lewis Francis, the sprinter, you know. But I don't miss the politics. Don't, you know what I mean? I know there's a whole bunch in there. You know, I know we just had the trials this weekend and some of the talent that I, that I witnessed, amazing. And I'm glad we're back to where we need to be. Do you know what I mean? Because remember, I grew up watching athletics yeah, and athletics was always on my TV, you know, and that's what got me into the sport. And like you said, there's got to be something for ex-athletes to motivate the next generation because when you retire, there's nothing. And that's what's heartbreaking. You know, you're kind of left to your own devices. You know what I mean? But it's just what it is. What are some of your favourite memories from the Commonwealth Games, both on track and off track? Give me an off track one, actually, first, before we even go into it. Uh, off track for me, early 2010, experience was told not to leave the village because of obviously the conflictions that were happening in the world at the time. But I don't listen to that. I had to leave. I've travelled off. <laughs> Delhi, and it. So um, I took a walk around the streets and the levels from rich to poor is mad. It's crazy. And um, it humbled me, man. I ain't going to lie. You're like traveling around the world and seeing other people's struggles and, and successes. It humbles me, man. And um, um, Delhi for me was a great experience because I was coming from a dark place within and then going there and seeing people that are in darker places, you know, and realizing the opportunities that I have in my life. I had to go and capitalize on these opportunities. So going into that race, I was doing a lot of self-reflection. I was thinking about my, my journey in track and field, my career so far to date. Because so I knew my time was almost up, you know. I was nervous. I, I don't think I thought about the race as much as I did previous years. I knew I did the work. I knew I was in good shape. I knew I was in good spirit. So all I needed to do was deliver on the day. So for me, um, Delhi, was, Delhi for, for me was a changing of guards as such. You know, I had to re, re, come back as a new person. And so I was reflecting on a lot of things. Again, Sydney, again, 2006, a great experience. You know, um, somewhere that I would never normally go. It was too far. But having the opportunity to go there for athletics and see how people live was amazing because... In England, as you know, we spend a lot of time indoors because of the weather. Australia was an outdoory place and we spent a lot of time outdoors and I think that helped me physically as well to get ready for the championships. Um, but yeah, but the winner for me was always Manchester. Just stepping out and you see the British crowd. You know, um, don't matter if they're from Scotland, Wales, Ireland, we all got a cheer, do you know what I mean? Because we're representing the UK, even though it's the Commonwealth Games. And that was humbling as well because I was only 18 at the time and it was my very first major championships. And um, I went out there and uh, I did the best that I did, but never got the result that I got. And it was a stiff lesson at such a young age not to give up on your dreams. And I think that there set me up for the rest of the experiences that I had. So, yeah. You're going you're gonna to be in Birmingham? I'm going to try and be in Birmingham. I'm going to try and be in Birmingham. It would be nice to be in Birmingham. Try? What do you mean? You're not being invited, Mark. You're not, you, ain't, you ain't got a box or anything down there. Not officially yet. I haven't been invited officially. You know, I've, I've been doing a lot of work with Birmingham 2022, which I'm grateful for. So oh, I'm but they're going to have a ton of tickets for you. Because, yeah. no, yeah. like I said, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Birmingham may never see it again in my lifetime, so I'd love to be a part of it. And um, being an ex-athlete from Birmingham, you know, it makes sense it makes sense to go in it but let's just see what happens then no, it does it does and, and and maybe on another occasion we'll get into um you know other championships outside of the commonwealth games i wanted that to be the focus today but it's birmingham's a special place for me as well because i i didn't get accredited for 2002 um that was like my first year on the job i just missed the accreditation process so i had to watch it from far um while my editor, sports editor at the time, still sports editor, Rodney Hines, got to go down there and watch the stadium being built. And just like you mentioned in the interview, seeing that transition to what it is now, I mean, into the Manchester City's home ground, just the whole thought process behind what Athletic Stadium could be after that. Just a lot of the things that happened um, in that championships, for that championships, in and around it, were just firsts, you know, the the inclusion of, of you know, differently abled athletes, 
um, it, it, on the main stage. You know, that was that was a, a significant thing. Um, my first championships, though, major championships, I called them major, um, were the World Indoors, uh, which were the following year in Birmingham. Um, so that was the first time we really got to kind of chop it up in the mix on, uh, I, I think, a uh, uh, major. You was at the World Indoors, right? You were there, yeah. World Indoors, but I met you first at a European Cup, if you uh, remember. Oh, wow. Okay, 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 okay. So that was prior. Well, oh, yes, in Italy. Was that in Italy? Remember? Yes, I do, I do. That was... That's yeah, the first I do. I think I just won the 100 metres and we did our first interview. And I was like, where? There's a man doing interviews. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was like, this is what I'm talking about. And the way how you conducted the interview for me made me feel like I can talk to you freely. And ever since that moment, it's like you don't feel like a journalist because we have so much life experiences that are so similar but different paths, if that makes any sense. No, no, I appreciate you for saying that. And, and it's very true. You know, there's a... Uh... There's definitely a way that we connected in those early days and I do connect with people from similar background. Yeah. Um, I guess that makes it a lot easier to have the conversation. So I well, appreciate you saying. Because again, like most of the journalists at that time was trying to paint me as a bad boy of athletics where you would just bring it down and say, no, this is the problem that we have in our school classes where there's 30 kids and the black kid gets picked out for being the loudest, the loudest. Do you understand? Yeah the loudest, that's the word, and gets told to go stand outside the classroom. Mm. Yeah, that's what I was having within athletics, where I would speak to you as a family member and you could you could translate my word to a place where people could understand me as a person and I respect you for that and I always will, trust me. So, yeah. I love, love for that, love for that. I mean, listen, it's, it's like I said, Birmingham has always been a special and always will be. I remember that, you know, I think I've told you this before, but I feel like, I felt the first year I worked down there that I should have just bought a property and yeah. I, regret, I regret I regret not doing it now to be honest that was that was one of the that's one of the things I really really regret big up all the Birmingham people listen it's going to be an amazing occasion for the city um I know you'll be down there I know we'll we'll bump heads and stuff we won't have a drink like we used to because it's not that for me anymore but you know it's uh it'll still be good to kind of knock heads and you know just walk around and I like to see I like to see how people gravitate to people like you guys. You know, it's um a different sport track and field. You know, the fans really feel comfortable approaching the stars, former stars, former big names. Um, so I like to observe all of that. And yeah, it's 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 just all love. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, man. Birmingham again, like for me, again, every time I go home, I always get welcomed, you know, um the love that I have now, even just when I'm visiting and you know. The love is always amazing. You know, um, I know Birmingham's going to put on a good show. Um, the build-up so far in the surrounding areas have definitely, definitely reshaped and they're, they're looking amazing. I want them to stay looking amazing and I want I want Birmingham to be able to grow now as the set, second city, you know, that we are and um, start developing some of the world's best athletes again. It's not. It's been a little while since we've developed any great athletes out of the out of Birmingham. You know, if I've forgotten any athletes at the moment, I'm not talking about you. But the the way we used to produce athletes before, I think it's kind of phased away a little bit. You know, um, and I think we need to focus on the future now and the future of the sport. You know, and working with the grassroots as well. I think grassroots athletics is very important. My athletics started in English schools, and I think you know. Uh, after these games, you know, um, people should start financing the next generation. If that makes any sense. So, yeah.